All right. So、um, I wanted to speak today about the purpose, the origins, and the evolution of social meditation. And the purpose for me is something that's continued to, to become clearer as I've done the practice. I've been doing social meditation, I'd say, as a regular part of my practice, maybe as the bulk of my practice for the last, now going on 10 years.、Um, and during that time, I've seen my understanding of it continue to deepen and change. And so you're getting my current version of that. Of course, it'll continue to change, as all things do. but I'd say for me, the, the core purpose of social meditation as I've seen it is to train in introspection. And I don't mean introspection, I mean introspection. And、um, it's interesting, I had to actually come up with this word. It's not in the dictionary.、Uh, I tried to find it、um, or something like it. Um, introspection, I think, is very clear. You know, this is the often we talk about meditation, we talk about introspection, the examination or observation of one's own mental and emotional and physical processes.、Um, this is usually what people mean when they talk about meditation or mindfulness that we're introspecting. But of course, you could also、uh, extrospect, you could look outside, you can observe、um, or examine what's outside oneself. You could observe physical processes as, as is done in biology or physics. You could make observations about the natural world.、Um, and social meditation, it's kind of a combination of these two of introspection and extrospection. We're looking in and out at the same time, or at least we're toggling back and forth between those perspectives.、Um, and, and this word for me, introspection, it captures. The essence of what social meditation is about. So, if introspection is the examination or observation of one's own experience, and extrospection is the examination or observation of the outside world, then introspection, we could say, is the examination or observation of what's in between, among, or within us. And I think the word,、um, That gets added to each of these, you know, inter, ex, exo, extra, and introspection is interesting. We could say we're taking an introspective、um, position. We're, we're,、um, and, and, and the word spective here it connects to the English word perspective. We're taking a particular perspective on experience when we do social meditation.、Um, In traditional solo silent meditation, the understanding really is that in the introspective way of practicing, that we're, we're seeing what's arising in our experience as all being part of our personal first person experience, our subjective experience. This is what's arising. And, in, and from, that, from that perspective, there's nothing that's arising outside of our experience that we will ever experience. Um, the only thing we know is our experience seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking.、Um, you know, is there anything that you can experience that's outside of, that, of your experience? If there is, you wouldn't be able to experience it, okay? Simple、uh, and profound from a certain point of view. You know, when you get, oh, the only thing I will ever experience is what's arising in this body and mind, arising in this experience. There's something profoundly liberating about that, or can be. But it's also not completely true because you over there are having your experience as well. Or at least we act like that's true, right? We, act, we treat each other as if we're,、uh, I mean, usually, some days we don't, <laughs> but usually we treat each other as if, as if we are each our, our, our own beings having our own experience. And that we don't completely know each other's experience. We don't know what's happening always for each other. We're often confused about that. I mean, that's why so many tensions arise in relationships, right? Because we don't know what's going on in this other body mind. So you could say, from a second person perspective, where there's an I and a you, there becomes the possibility of a we, you know, of, of, of a mutual understanding or a shared experience. I think that's the miracle. It's one of my, one of my, Early mentors, Ken Wilber, called it the miracle of we. 
you know, that there, there's this possibility that we can have a shared understanding despite the fact that I'm over here having my own experience and you're over there having yours. Um, so introspection, social meditation is really about developing the skills and the capacity to, to have a better understanding of what's arising here and what's arising there, what's arising within and between and among us. And, and I think there's a deeper truth here which gets revealed through the practice, I'll claim this, you can see for yourself. But the deeper truth for me has been in seeing the way that experience co-arises, that we each are shaping each other's experience, that we're able to tune into each other's experience and that our actions, our words, our experience affects each other, um, deeply affects each other. And so I think one of the deeper things that can happen, or one of the, one of the possibilities in social meditation is that we can um, begin to interrogate or question our typical understanding, which is that I'm over here having my experience and it's separate from you over there having your experience. And perhaps if we're lucky, we use the right words or we communicate well, or we go do it, you know, some relationship coaching or therapy, you know, maybe we can figure out how to speak better to you know, we can communicate better. And I think that's true. That's true. And it's also true that if you really get deep into what experience is, you know, how it's arising moment to moment, how it's uh, experience is affecting um, itself through each other, then there's the possibility also of experiencing the collapse of what, what we could call the self other duality that this sense in our mind that I am separate and I am over here and you are separate and you are over there, that that itself can be seen as a conception, as an idea that's arising in our experience, that's being reinforced through other people's behavior and through, through the way that they communicate and talk. But that actually, when we get down to the basic level of what's arising, very often experience, we, our experience syncs up. You know, we have an experience of oneness. You know, where the same thing in the same moment is arising for both of us. And there's a sense in that co-arising that there's not a me over here having my experience and a you over there having your experience. There's just the experience. There's just what's arising. And it's an arising in a shared field. The other thing I think, uh, the other purpose of social meditation is to unearth and to uncover our social conditioning you know, how we tend to be with other people. Um, because how we are here in this environment is not that different from how we are with other people in other environments. Yes, it's a different environment, so there are differences, but we're still who we are. We're, st we're still carrying around our conditioning and our, you know, our habits and our, our strengths and our uh, misconceptions, and we bring those everywhere we go. And so we bring them here into this practice. And, and we, might, we might notice very simple things like, oh, I I was skipped during that round of social meditation, and now I'm feeling really pissed. And you know, suddenly we start to unearth this conditioning, like, oh, I I feel like things always have to be ordered, you know, and I, and I feel like if I'm ever skipped or I'm left behind, like it really upsets me. And I start to I start to kind of become aware of this conditioning because, of course, like usually in social meditation, it's something innocuous, you know, some, someone just forgets, you know, they have a moment where their mind is wandering, or perhaps their microphone doesn't pick up their note. And so, you know, you don't hear them. And, and then suddenly, you, you, we can see that we start to add and layer all of this stuff on top of this really simple experience. And, and that reflects more on our conditioning than it does on what's actually happening often. So, there's an opportunity with social meditation to also work on becoming free within our social conditioning to become more spacious and more flexible, more forgiving, uh, more compassionate uh, about what's arising for us. We can also see our preferences in social meditation. We can see how we prefer that things go. You know, we can see, okay, I'm, I'm doing this sequential six sense noting and I, I notice I want it to go quick. You know, I want, it to the, I want the pace to be rapid. I want there to be a sense of bum, 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 bum. And when someone doesn't, you know, go slower or they, they take some time and then they note, I might feel irritated or impatient. Okay, great. That's fine. That's part of the practice. It, un it uncovers our preferences. It uncovers our conditioning. It shows us 
how we'd like things to be. And, uh, and then it shows us, especially importantly, uh, the gap between how we want them to be and how they are. Um, and, and then we can work with that gap. We can work with uh, the suffering that arises <laughs> in the difference between how I'd like it to be and how it is. And I think another interesting and really important uh, purpose of social meditation reason for practicing it is it gives us as practitioners, as meditators, an opportunity to practice verbally expressing our insight, our insights, our experience. And, and for me as a, as a practitioner, I didn't have much practice with this before I started doing social meditation. I had some, um, but I mostly experienced medita meditation as something I did in solitude. And it was like this thing that was just happening over here. And then when I went to try to describe what I was experiencing or tell someone why it was so important to me, I would often not be able to do that. It'd be very difficult. Whereas if you actually can meditate out loud and you can just show someone what it is, seeing, thinking, hearing, feeling, this is what it's like to be me. This is what it's like to have this experience. And in social practice, you'll start to notice if you haven't already, you know, that, that how we do this is really interesting. You know, sometimes we're rehearsing what we want to say before we say it. And we're trying to come up with the right note. You know, we're trying to come up with something that'll sound good. Um, and there can, there's a feeling often of like, oh, like this doesn't quite, this doesn't quite feel authentic or real. I'm kind of over here rehearsing and I'm absorbed in my own thoughts. I'm not really listening to what's going on for other people. Um, and yeah, that's true. Um, there, there is this beautiful way uh, when we're really synced up with our experience and just moment to moment we're having an experience, we're being with it, we're sharing it um, as it's happening. Um, that in a way there's there's a, a, an aliveness to the words that we use. Um, there's a Zen teacher I really appreciate based in New Zealand. He said, the essential cannot be expressed in words. Rather, it's expressed as words. This is Ross Bulletaire in a book called uh, Dongshan's Five Ranks, The Keys to Enlightenment. And I thought that's such a beautiful expression, um, the essential can't be expressed in words. We can't capture the depth of this experience in words. One or two words isn't going to do it. You know, it's not going to capture the wholeness of what's arising. But that one or two words in the right moment, if we're really connecting with what's happening and we're sharing openly, clearly, it can express the wholeness. It can be a pointer for each other toward our own wholeness to seeing what's so. So here with social meditation, we, get, we have an opportunity to practice expressing an alive sense of what's occurring for us. And that can be incredibly helpful um, for everyone, um, particularly if you're in a position where people are, you're, you have to speak as part of what you do and people listen to you. To keep it to keep it alive, to keep it fresh, to keep it really connected to what's arising, rather than in this really like abstract space of conceptualization, um, you know, it, it it really helps people connect with with what's being said. And and the other purpose of this practice, and this is how it originated, it it really was a pedagogical improvement on traditional meditation instructions. That's how it was originally created. Kenneth Folk. When he developed social noting, one of the families of social meditation that, were, that we started to practice here today, he did it because he wanted to find a better way to teach his students. Um, he was working with folks on Skype at the time, and he had this problem with traditional noting meditation, the, the original technique that this was derived from. It's called mental noting. It was developed by a Burmese uh, monk named Mahasi Sayada. And Kenneth had trained in that tradition in Burma, in uh, Thailand, and Myanmar. He had gone and done years of retreat practice, uh, studying with um, Burmese teachers, Sayada Ukundala, most notably, uh, and Sayada Upandita. And what he found in learning those techniques is that the pedagogy was kind of weird. 
It's like you'd, he'd go and he'd get the instructions from the teacher and they'd say, okay, go off and do that. Go off and note your experience and then come back and then report on what you've experienced. Share what it is that you experience and then I'll give you, I'll give you some feedback and I'll tell you how to refine your technique. Well, okay, great. But the problem is, mul- is manifold. There's multiple problems with this from a, from a teaching perspective. One is that there's a huge gap between the time that I receive the instructions and the time that I get feedback often. Sometimes people get instructions and they never have anyone to check in with about, about the practice. They never get feedback. They just go off and do it and they you know, often will just miss and they will do it wrong. You know? <laughs> They'll just not understand the technique. Um, um, and so here with, with, the, with social meditation, the feedback is instant. You know, we can instantly hear how each other is practicing. And if there's someone with more experience in the group, you can hear how, what it's like for someone who has five or 10 or 20,000 hours of practice experience. Uh, and so Kenneth found that was extremely helpful teaching social meditation one-on-one that he could, he could note and then someone else could note, he could note, they could note, go back and forth. And he could immediately give them feedback on their technique and what they were doing and how they were practicing. And he could immediately model what expert meditation looks like. And people could see it and they could absorb that and they could bring that into their practice instead of it being this kind of mystery, you know? Um, so those are some of the reasons, I think, the purpose of social meditation, um, some of the benefits that can come from doing it, some of the possibilities. And, and, and I already mentioned a little bit about the origins. You know, Kenneth Folk developed this practice, again, to improve his teaching. And then he sort of discovered, kind of almost as a side effect, that it opened up this whole introspective way of being. Like that we, it became, meditation became intersubjective. It became a relational thing when you do it out loud together. And it extends the traditional meditative awareness and insight into relationship. You know, so there's, there's this tremendous benefit that was unexpected. Uh, he started, I'd been working with Kenneth since 2005 as a, as, a, as a teacher, and I'd learned traditional practice from him and instructions. And um, I found him to be a great teacher. And so when he's told me that he had developed this new technique and he was super excited about it, he wanted to share it. I was just starting to teach myself at the time. And I was like, oh, great. Anything I can use that'll make me a better teacher because I suck right now. <laughs> Uh, I want to learn. And so he, ta- he, he taught me social noting and, uh, and it took me a minute or two to get it. Um, but I did, I got it. And I said, oh my God, this is amazing. In 2011, I went and did a, a facilitator training with Kenneth um, in San Francisco where he was living at the time. And uh, strangely or interestingly enough, it happened in the PayPal mansion, San Francisco. So he was at the time he was the private meditation instructor to one of the originator uh, originators of PayPal, and he was living for a short time in their home. Several other guys that lived there, and so we were doing this social meditation thing in this very to me it was a bizarre environment. You know, this multi million dollar mansion in San Francisco overlooking the bay. So okay, that's where it happened. Um, part of the story, um, and it was great. And I, I, brought, I, I brought it into my teaching at that point, and I continued to teach the techniques that Kenneth had developed. And I also started at a certain point to develop my own practices. As I started to get a better understanding of how the practice worked, uh, I started to see more opportunities to translate other traditional meditation techniques, to bring them out loud, to do them out loud. So my wife, Emily, and I, who was also at that initial facilitator training, we started to play around with social breath counting taking the traditional Zen instructions of counting from one to 10 using the breath um, to help you kind of synchronize the count and stay connected with breathing. And we began to expand on the noting technique and add other practices and do other things inspired a lot uh, by what Kenneth had done. And for me, it it just became this interesting, amazing uh, opportunity to, suddenly it felt like meditation was open-ended again. Um, like there was all this possibility, like no one had thought about doing this. So if they hadn't thought about doing this, what else haven't, haven't they thought about? You know, what else is possible? Um, and social meditation for me has become a, a, an open-ended and evolving approach to being with experience with each other. 
And it's very much co-evolving because the things that I've learned happen in sessions with other people. Oftentimes someone will say something or do something. Someone will do a technique incorrectly and it'll reveal a new possible way of practicing. You know, this is the reason I don't try to in, uh, enforce the instructions. I just try to explain them. <laughs> you know, I don't try to tell people you did that wrong. It's like, no, well, sometimes doing it wrong, wrong actually means doing it in a way that we'd never considered. So, um, so social meditation is very much an open-ended evolving practice. And, uh, so what I'm sharing here with you here, isn't the end of the story. It's not the final realization. It's the, it's the current iteration.